The anniversary of an exodus. Four years after Rohingya Muslims fled a violent military crackdown in Myanmar, their future remains as uncertain as ever. Will this marginalized minority ever be able to return home? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the plight of the Rohingya. It is four years to the day since hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees from Myanmar's Rakhine state began flooding into southeastern Bangladesh. They were fleeing a military crackdown that witnesses say included mass killings, torture and rape. The predominantly Muslim minority had long been denied citizenship and had faced decades of repression and discrimination. Under successive regimes, more than a million are now stateless, scattered through refugee camps with no clarity on what their future holds. Keisha Ferguson explains how they got there. On August 25, 2017, a Rohingya insurgent group attacks police posts and an army camp in Western Myanmar's Rakhine state, killing 12 people. Myanmar security forces and Buddhist vigilantes respond with a campaign of violence against the Rohingya population at large. Hundreds of thousands flee to Cox's Bazaar in neighboring Bangladesh in what will soon become one of the largest refugee camps in the world. As pressure from the international community mounts, the UN's top human rights official denounced Myanmar for conducting a, quote, cruel military operation against the Rohingya, branding it a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. On September 18, Human Rights Watch called for targeted sanctions and an arms embargo against Myanmar's military in response to their offensive. By now, 400,000 have fled the country. The next day, Myanmar's then state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi addressed the crisis for the first time, saying the strife between communities in Rakhine state had existed since the 19th century and that restoring trust and harmony would take time. Periodically, trouble has broken out there between the Muslim community and the Rakhine community, and we have inherited this very complex problem and we have to deal with it and we have to resolve it. So obviously it's not something that we can do overnight and it's not something that uh, we can uh, find simple answers to. A year later, in October of 2018, Myanmar officials visited Cox's Bazaar in an effort to begin repatriating some of those who had fled. But those plans collapsed when the first group of 2,200 refused to go back after being denied full citizenship despite being born in Myanmar. On August 25, two years after the military crackdown began, rallies took place in encampments throughout southern Bangladesh to remember those killed in the violence. By now, more than a million Rohingya were living in what had become the world's largest refugee settlement. Despite the squalid conditions, the lack of citizenship as well as a fear of violence kept many from returning home. In December of 2019, Aung San Suu Kyi appeared before the International Court of Justice to answer charges brought by the Gambia accusing Myanmar of genocide. Months later, the ICJ ordered Myanmar to take, quote, urgent measures to protect its Muslim Rohingya population from persecution and atrocities and preserve evidence of alleged crimes against them. In late 2020, as the coronavirus pandemic tore through Rohingya camps, Bangladesh's government began transferring thousands of refugees to Basanchar a remote island in the Bay of Bengal. That was despite aid groups deeming the conditions unlivable, as well as the serious risk of severe storms and floods engulfing the site. The UN announced 2020 as the deadliest year on record as people made the attempts to cross the Bay of Bengal and the Adaman Sea. In March 2021, a huge fire swept through a Rohingya camp in Bulukhali, 
destroying thousands of homes and killing at least 11 people, as well as displacing 45,000. 300 remain missing. And in August, at least 200 refugees have been arrested trying to escape the dire conditions on Basin Char, described by refugees as a prison island. After a surge in COVID-19 infections in Bangladesh, aid workers are warning of a humanitarian disaster if an outbreak occurs in Cox's Bazaar. Well, the Rohingya struggle continues, but it's fallen into the shadow of multiple other crises around the world. So with less attention from the international community, can the plight of the Rohingya improve? And if the crisis is ignored, what price might we all have to pay? Well, to discuss that, let's cross to Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, where I'm joined by Rusikesh Harichandan. He is the head of the Red Cross and Red Crescent delegation to Cox's Bazaar. In London is Mong Zarni, a human rights activist and coordinator of the Free Rohingya Coalition. And Ronan Lee is a visiting scholar at Queen Mary University's International State Crime Initiative in London. He's also the author of Myanmar's Rohingya Genocide. Now, we invited a representative of Bangladesh's government onto the show. Unfortunately, uh, they declined. But in July, the ruling party called upon the international community to play a visible and effective role in ensuring the return of the forcibly displaced Rohingyas with full security and dignity. Shrusi Keshara Chandan, I'll start with you. You are in Cox's Bazaar, so begin by telling us what the conditions are there today, four years uh, since the camp was initially built. Thank you very much for uh, having me in this discussion. And uh, as I go to the field, I, I can see the people, uh, you know, this uh, place where the people have been living, almost 900,000, they live in 34 congested camps. And, uh, but when you reach to the camps, we can see there are a lot of lively activities. People, children are playing. You can find also the adults, particularly. They are busy in their, uh, you know, humanitarian aid management. Usually, basically, many, many of them, they are busy on building their shelter. And they collect also shelter materials from uh, the distribution sites. Similarly, uh, the food distribution, as well as health and water sanitation activities are very lively. So having said that, I can tell you that people over years have understood how to live in this difficult situation. Though they are living in a very difficult uh, terrain, which is prone to flood and also prone to cyclonic storm, and COVID-19 has made the conditions even more bad. Despite all that, we could see many children, many uh, people in the families, they live their life there. And right. they are, of course, they are waiting for a good time to come in future. Right. Um, so it sounds from what you're saying that aid workers, for example, NGOs are all doing a good job uh, at administering services in Cox's Bazaar. But what you're also describing is that this is almost taking on a permanent nature uh, as the refugees there get more and more used to uh, having to survive in this camp. Does, does that worry you? Uh, in fact, uh, the local people, the Bangladesh government, uh, you know, authorities, as well as all humanitarian organizations, they look for a better future of the people who have been living in this part. Having said that, there is always a desire that people should go back to their homeland. They should have a better life back at their native place. And uh, given the, you know, the border movement and the tension in Myanmar, things have been very difficult now. So people are not really confident that they would decide to go at this point of time. So having said that, I, I can see that this is a little bit of a situation where the support must continue for a longer period. And we have to think from that point of view. Okay. I, I just have to ask you personally, did you ever expect this now with upwards of a million people to become what the UN considers the world's biggest refugee camp? Yes, yes uh, the, the, the situation in the camp, you know, all the humanitarian organizations, including UN and the government, all they understand the situation of the people in uh, people's life, how they have been impacted, and all possible supports, even the low, in the, the the national authority, in the the UN bodies, the Bangladesh Red Crescent and International Federation, 
other humanitarian organizations they have been supporting this and trying to make to see that there is a, a better quality of life but given that the the need is so huge that it takes uh, really a lot of resources and also a lot of uh, planning required in terms of make, making sure that people have access to all the basic needs right. uh, at least when they are here Ronan Lee, if I can, I want to put a, a similar question to you. Um, hearing what was being described just there, and we know that the NGOs and aid workers on the ground are doing a remarkable job of administering, you know, to million, uh, upwards of a million people now. Um, and that is admirable in itself, but is this becoming now a permanent structure uh, in Bangladesh, Cox's Bazaar? Is it now the residence of a million Rohingya refugees? Well, I think the concern uh, fact, is that the displacement is becoming permanent, mm -hmm. uh, but the facilities that are available to the Rohingya community and the, the life opportunities that have been made available to the Rohingya community are, aren't matching that permanence. And we see, you can see the images from the camps, even four years after a genocidal displacement of 2017, uh, the facilities are not permanent facilities. They, they've been the, the residents of the camps have been prevented from building permanent facilities that would would provide opportunities for, for a, an economy or, or any sense of industry or any sense of normal life. They're, they're been required to live in a permanent state of, of temporality, really, that, that, that they've been told you're here temporarily, uh, you're a refugee that, that has uh, limited rights in Bangladesh, uh, some of your humanitarian concerns will be addressed, but ultimately you're not allowed to put down roots, you're not allowed to learn the local language, and you're not allowed to develop any industry, the sorts of things that we would associate with, with normal, uh, bustling urban life. Uh, th these camps are now the fifth, uh, the, fifth dense, uh, the fifth largest urban site within Bangladesh. Uh, they're, they're among the world's most densely populated places. And you can see that they're, they're, not, they're not brick and concrete. They're, they're bamboo and tarpaulin. And mm. four years on, that will be devastating for the Rohingya residents of, of those places and, and not conditions that we should ask any human being to endure long term. Right. But I mean, must we have some sympathy then for the Bangladeshi government? You know, they obviously didn't choose this. Uh, but still, have they done, you know, the best they possibly could to manage this massive population who's, who's crossed the border? Uh, look, I've been, o over the, the four years since 2017, I've been, been um, uh, I've provided praise for, for the, the humanitarian stance at times of the Bangladeshi government. They have shouldered the burden more than anyone else on the face of the planet in terms of the, the massive influx of refugees in 2017. Uh, but th there's more that needs to be done. And, and I understand that over time, the patience of of a you know, Bangladesh is a poor country. Uh, it, mm. It's not rich, and it will be feeling that it's it's shouldering more of a burden than than the West is in terms of uh, in terms of the Rohingya refugees. But some of the things that need to be allowed to occur, I think, is that it, it that there has to be an an acknowledgement that camp residents have got to be able to access education services. They've got to be able to build more permanent buildings that can survive. Uh, that can survive uh, the, 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 the monsoon or weather conditions. They've got to be allowed to have some sense of being able to build an industry within the camp so that they can have normal lives. Right. I mean, they're going to be there for a long time, I think, into the future. But then and who, they should be allowed to have normal lives. Who is responsible for that? I mean, that is a challenge in Bangladesh countrywide uh, to get permanent schools built and to cater to the indigenous Bangladeshi population. So who is it up to? Quickly, Ronan, if you can, to get the basic infrastructure built, just schools, so that children, a generation doesn't lose an education here. I, I think if Bangladesh felt that the West would step up with better resources and that there was a long-term plan and a commitment to the Rohingya long-term, then I think Bangladesh would be far more willing to allow for uh, permanent schools to be built and for other services to be made on a, on a more permanent basis within the camps. But Bangladesh is worried that it's going to be left long term with, with a displaced population of Myanmar nationals uh, who, who, were, who were brutally deported across the border. And, and they're worried that they'll be left bearing the humanitarian cost. I mean, it's, it's, right. uh, I mean, it's, it's not something that, 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 they've, they, that they would necessarily grumble about, but it is a, a serious public policy concern about them and the people who need to step up are the West. Right. We, and we all have to prepare for the, the fact that this could become a, a permanent 
permanent structure in a sense. Then, Mong Zarni, let me uh, turn to you now. You know, we're looking now at humanitarian crises in Afghanistan, uh, continuing war in Syria. There's massive starvation in Yemen, massive displacements in Africa. How much has it hurt the Rohingya cause to fall really this far out of the global spotlight now? Well, I think, like, you know, the, 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 the fundamental issues need to be um, established before I can address that issue. Uh, firstly, the, uh, you know, the Rohingya crisis is, uh, you know, uh, has a humanitarian symptom, but it is essentially a state crime uh, that my own country of Burma has institutionalized uh, the persecution and destruction of Rohingya over the last uh, 40 years. And and uh, at this point in time, you know, after 40 years, five massive waves of, uh, you know, survival flight or exoduses by the Rohingya since 1978, the both the humanitarian uh, the community or industry, if some would use that word, and uh, Bangladesh, the state of Bangladesh, have become a part of the problem. You know, in 1978, the, uh, the UNHCR, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, based in Geneva, has 16 million uh, the dollar package. Uh, you know, uh, the, to help the, um, you know, to nearly 200,000. Uh, the Rohingyas to to to, uh, to accommodate and uh, eventually repatriate back, and now the um, humanitarian aid uh, you know uh, the budget has grown to be in the uh, you know um, the several billions over the last four years, and Bangladesh today even. Uh, instead of recognizing Rohingya as refugee by their own legal status and with all the rights uh, pertaining to the term refugees, Bangladesh restrict uh, and confiscate even uh, you know the T-shirts printed to commemorate uh, the the largest wave of genocidal purge uh, that occurred in 2017. So the, the Rohingya, I mean, the my initial enthusiasm and praise for the state of Bangladesh for being uh, kind and compassionate towards, uh, you know, Rohingya has uh, has gone out of the window. Okay, Rohingya, it, it, uh, it, it, but before you go any further, I mean, it, to what end? I, explain that. To what end is the Bangladeshi government doing what you're, what you're saying it's done? I mean, down to the detail of confiscating T-shirts. Yes, uh, you know, 200 T-shirts printed by Rohingya youth uh, to gather and commemorate the, uh, you know, the what they consider a uh, uh, genocide day today, 25th August, and that they, the Rohingyas are not well, allowed to, to gather today. Why yeah, is well, that, though? Why, why is the Bangladeshi government stopping that? Well, Bangladesh's government... Uh, is uh, they're pursuing a misguided policy of, you know, treating Rohingya refugees as simply a burden instead of a community that need to be enabled and empowered so that when when time comes for repatriation, they can rebuild their own communities back in uh, Burma where uh, they belong. And so the Bangladesh has turned towards this, uh, you know, a rather immoral and some would say illegal uh, measures such as like forcibly relocating upward of 100,000 Rohingyas, or that's the plan, to this island two hours off the coast of Bangladesh that has never been uh, inhibited by any human community, not even Bang Bengali fishermen found that island fit for human right. habitation. You're talking about the island Basan Char. The Bang Bangladeshi state is violating ethical and uh, legal uh, norms of, uh, you know, our world. Right. Hrusikesh, if I can ask you about that, uh, Basan Char, some have called it a de facto prison island. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Rohingya have been relocated there. Uh, we're hearing a number of complaints that they're not even allowed to visit family members on the mainland that they've actually just been trapped there. At first, it seemed uh, that there were a lot of services being provided and that structures had been built to accommodate the refugees on uh, Basan Char Island. But now we're hearing that the infrastructure is somewhat falling apart. What can you tell us uh, from, the, from the aid's 
organization's perspective? Yes, uh, I would like to tell you that, uh, yes, there could be, you know, decisions at a different level, but we see 18,000 uh, people, they have been uh, there. And uh, when our directors, uh, directors and volunteers are there, we do have visited those facilities to see that uh, how they are comparatively in, in good uh, condition or not. But to, to honestly to tell you, those shelters have been built is a very good uh, study, particularly looking at the facilities they provide. There are some practical challenges with regard to the communication. I think uh, now there is a uh, memorandum of understanding which is under process to be signed between UN and the government, where it will facilitate more support from UN communities, particularly the uh, INGO communities to be there. That is one thing. The second thing, uh, Bangladesh Rector Center as being uh, an auxiliary, also have our volunteers who have been supporting, particularly those communities who have been staying there. We also understand that these 18,000 people, they have, uh, you know, time and again, they have some problems with regard to some of these uh, places, particularly on uh, health issues, but then it was already addressed by the government. We do have uh, our teams in the, at this site to really update us about the basic okay. needs. And I, we hope that there will be, things will be improving gradually. Okay, Ronan, let me come back to you. Um, we only have a few minutes left and there's, there's a bigger issue here as well in that if we look at the future of the Rohingya population, we have to ask what can actually really be done if the uh, military regime uh, that took power in a coup uh, is still in power and it flaunts international law on a regular basis um, and it doesn't seem to mind being a pariah state. I mean, what can really be done for a population of refugees that are now so firmly across the border in Bangladesh uh, if you have the so-called regime you have now in Myanmar? Well, when you've got a rogue regime like we now have with the military in power in after the coup in Myanmar, the responsibility for dealing with that falls to the United Nations Security Council. The, the, the solution for the Rohingyas issue lies in Myanmar. Ultimately, the reason they're in Bangladesh is because the circumstances uh, back, back in their home on their ancestral lands is unsafe for them. So the, the long-term solution for the Rohingya must involve the Rohingya been allowed to return safely to their ancestral lands within Myanmar. And the key to that involves getting the military out of power within Myanmar for once and for all. And the, the people who have to be, or who are responsible for that under international law, the United Nations Security Council, they're the ones who are the guardians of international security and, and the safety of people on the planet. They're not living up to their responsibilities. They're, they're more than happy, it seems, to have 50 million people within Myanmar governed by a brutal military dictatorship. Right. The, Rohingya is, the Rohingya's plight is one, one symptom of that problem within Myanmar, but um, the, the way COVID-19 is, is ripping through the Myanmar community as well is another symptom. Right. I, I have to address one last issue then with Mong Zarni, and that is uh, regarding the potential consequences of keeping uh, Rohingya refugees languishing in, in the camps that they are now in in Bangladesh. Um, Maung, is there a risk that ARSA, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, whom Mian Marie's leadership uh, blames for sparking the Rohingya exodus in the first place, um, is there a chance that they will be able to exploit these last four years of, of real degradation um, with their community languishing there in those camps and then begin to effectively recruit and build its ranks off the back of the desperation of the Rohingya people? Well, I think the uh, Asar poses no threat to either Bangladesh or Burma. Uh, Asar is essentially a manufacturer pretext, although Asar does exist. And, and, and I think there is, uh, you know, a, a, a categorical uh, anti-Muslim racism involved. Every time, a, uh, I'm Buddhist myself, uh, the, every time a Muslim community takes up arm out of desperation and righteous anger, all of a sudden, we cannot see them as people fighting for their liberation. We look at them as potential terrorists. You know, Asa is no Taliban, uh, no ISIS, and they cannot operate without, uh, you know, the knowledge of Bangladeshi uh, intelligence services that control the... Um, 
uh, the camps and 900,000 people. So also it's not a problem. The problem is the continued and, and, and I would say humanitarianized and in, uh, institutionalized uh, existence. I wouldn't call it life. None of us on this show would ever want to be in that situation. Subhuman conditions where Rohingya exist. That is the long-term consequences, not for the Bangladeshi community, not for the international community, not for the UN. Okay. Mong Zarni, I will have to give you the last word. We are unfortunately out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers, but I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much for being with us, greatly appreciated, and to our viewers uh, for being with us as well. Remember, you can always follow us on Twitter at the underscore newsmakers. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your comments. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.